so, so good to me Before I took a breath You breathed your life in me Well, thank you for joining us again at the Journey Church. We're so glad that you're here. It's a beautiful Sunday morning outside. Glad you're here to worship Jesus with us. I want you to go back in your mind's eye and think about Easter. I still hope that we as a church will not forget what happened at Easter. A lot of times when Easter happens, then we just kind of fall back off and we just kind of walk into some new ways and we just kind of look for Christmas and then we look for Easter again the following year. But that's not really how Christ wants us to think about Easter is that once he died on the cross, was dead and buried for three days and rose again from the dead, then he started the church at Pentecost and then things really lit fire. Things took off and that's really what the 21st century again needs today in the local church is to see the church take off in the 20th century. So after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus, what are we to do now? This is our new sermon series right after Easter. We should be asking ourselves the question, Every day, after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus, what are we to do now? Well, as we walk through the book of Acts, Acts 1 sermon title was, What Would You Do If Jesus Left You and Went Back to Heaven? Acts 2, the church age began in power, not in weakness. In Acts 3, do you know how to share Jesus as you go about your daily life? Acts 4, the first century church shared Jesus often with confidence, with boldness, being persecuted and by giving lavishly in different financial ways. Acts chapter 5, the first century church held the members of the church accountable for their deceitfulness and lying. And in Acts 6, the first century church did not have a race and ethnicity problem because the gospel had changed their hearts. And as we walked through that chapter, we could see that there was a race problem. There was an ethnicity problem. There was racism and prejudice. But the gospel is what changed people to start loving God and loving people as the scripture declares. And the church dealt with a lot of that. And so they had more unity and love for one another. That's what the church needs today. Acts 7, the first century church knew the word of God lived the Word of God and died for the Word of God. And then today in Acts chapter 8, the first century church was persecuted, which scattered the believers. Then the believers scattered the gospel from the church out into society. Take your Bibles and let's turn to Acts chapter 8. Once you have found Acts chapter 8, I want us to do something for context because it's been two weeks since we've been in this chapter. I want us to back up from Acts chapter 8 to Acts chapter 7, verse 51. Let's get it in our mind again, in our hearts again, about what happened with this man named Stephen who had just become a deacon back here in Acts 6. And let's look at what happened when the council had him arrested and brought in and stood before them and they were questioning him and the questioning was really really difficult and he was being heavily persecuted so in Acts chapter 7 verse 51 let's read through 60 and then we'll start in Acts 8 1 and read through this is Stephen talking to the men toward the end of his explanation of what he believes about God and what he believes about Moses and what he believes about Jesus Acts 7 51 you men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You who received the law as ordained by angels and yet did not keep it. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the quick and they began gnashing their teeth at Stephen. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and covered their ears and rushed at him with one impulse. When they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And we know this is Saul of Tarsus. 
verse 59. They went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And having said this, he fell asleep, which means he died. Now, if you'll remember, Jesus had said something similar back in Luke 23, verse 34, when he said, when he was dying on the cross, Lord, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Isn't that such a Christ-like attitude? Jesus, as he was dying, said this of the people that persecuted him. Stephen was so filled with the Holy Spirit, he spoke basically just like his Savior Jesus did when Jesus was on the cross. Acts chapter 8, verse 1. Saul was in hearty agreement with putting Stephen to death. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house and dragging off men and women. He would put them in prison. Therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. The crowds with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip as they heard and saw the signs which he was performing. For in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them, shouting with a loud voice, and many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed. So there was much rejoicing in that city. Now there was a man named Simon who formerly was practicing magic in the city and astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. Now let's stop there for a minute. This was a magician. Now in our day and time, the 20th and 21st centuries, we hear the word magician and we think of someone that's an illusionist. We think of someone that does the sleight of hand, somebody that can all of a sudden just pull a coin out from behind your ear, someone that can pull a rabbit out of a hat, someone that can open up your coat and then start pulling out all of these sausages. Okay, that's not what this is. This was the real magic arts. He was doing divination. This was a magician doing magic, which is opposite of God's supernatural miracles. Verse 10. And they all, from smallest to greatest, were giving attention to him, saying, This man is what is called the great power of God. And they were giving him attention because he had for a long time astonished them with his magic arts. But when they believed Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued on with Philip. And as he observed signs and great miracles taking place, he was constantly amazed. Now when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they began laying their hands on them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money saying, give this authority to me as well, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have no part or portion in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours and pray the Lord that, if possible, the intention of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see you're in the gall of bitterness and in the bondage of iniquity. But Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me yourselves, so that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. So when they had solemnly testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they started back to Jerusalem and were preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. Now this is Peter and John making their way back to Jerusalem. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. So he got up and went. And there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure, and he had come to Jerusalem to worship. And he was returning and sitting in his chariot and was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the Spirit said to Philip, Go up and join this chariot. 
Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, Well, how could I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture which he was reading was this. He was led as a sheep to slaughter and as a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he does not open his mouth. In humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who will relate his generation? For his life is removed from the earth. The eunuch answered Philip and said, Please tell me, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or of someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, beginning with, from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. As they went along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through, he kept preaching the gospel to all the cities until he came to Caesarea. I think it's interesting with the eunuch that the minute he came to faith in Christ, the minute he came, what prevents me from being baptized? You know, one of the sad things that's happening in our generation, even in 2019 and 2020, is the fact that I've been sharing the gospel, sharing the gospel, sharing the gospel, and I'm seeing people convicted of their sins, saying that they want to put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, but then they do not want to be baptized, and they just keep putting it off and putting it off, and maybe one day or maybe one day. That is not a biblical record of what happens when somebody comes to faith in Christ. It is the first thing you should jump up and down to do. You should be saying, Pastor, can the baptism waters be filled for this coming Sunday? I'm ready to do this. This person was saved and baptized on the same day within less than an hour. It should grieve a believer's heart who's not desiring to be fully immersed, baptized the way the Bible teaches that we are to do. This person didn't wait to get back to Jerusalem. He didn't have a church way back here where he lived. He just said, I want to be baptized. I want to be baptized now. And by the way, there was only the officials with him. There was not a big church group gathering. It was just Philip and this new believer and the people there that witnessed it. But who else witnessed it? The Heavenly Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It was faithful for him to be baptized right in front of God. God saw it. That was a biblical baptism. They were not at the church, but this was a biblical baptism. Now, take your bulletins. I want you to write down this little phrase on the back, and I want you to think about it in the coming days. I want you to think about it in the coming days. The minute you hear it, you may go, well, Pastor, why do I need to think about it in the coming days? We, we're not experiencing this. You never know when you might experience this. So write this down. As Chuck Swindoll says, to be forewarned is forearmed. Write this down. Persecution is the pressure that is needed to propel the proclamation of the gospel. I'll keep saying it two or three times for you to write it all. Persecution is the pressure that is needed to propel the proclamation of the gospel. One more time. Persecution is the pressure that is needed to propel the proclamation of the gospel. The last part of chapter 7, verse 51 and following, and all of chapter 8 points to these bullet points. Listen carefully. The cause of the persecution of believers, the scene of the persecution of believers, the scattering of the believers, the proclamation of the gospel, the progression of Christianity, the exponential growth of the kingdom of God through believers, and finally, the new Christian leaders that were springing up from the gospel. That's a lot of bullet points to get from a chapter and a half. All of those things were happening because the Holy Spirit had come in power and the church began in power and these things were happening. Now I want to list off for you people and places that were receiving the gospel and people being saved and miraculous things being done. Stephen, that new deacon, 
Saul of Tarsus was saved, who became the Apostle Paul, and he was one of those new Christian leaders we were talking about. Philip, who was one of those new deacons, he began proclaiming the gospel even more than he used to. The Samaritans is one of the cities that they went to. They went to Samaria, and so many of the Samaritans were healed and saved. Simon the magician was saved and then followed along with the rest of the believers. The Ethiopian eunuch was saved, and then he went back to Ethiopia. And so probably many in Ethiopia were saved. And then Philip went on to the city of Azotus, and some hopefully there were saved. And then Caesarea is where he ended up last. And so just in a chapter and a half, all of that from Stephen all the way down to Caesarea, the Holy Spirit was moving powerfully in believers' lives. But persecution does not always propel the proclamation of the gospel. Here's why. When some believers undergo persecution, they initially become anxious, frightened, worried, and sometimes extremely fearful. Initially, that can be normal. But they begin following their feelings and try to protect themselves and stay away from any danger or opportunity to share the truth, to share Jesus, or to share the gospel. Therefore, they shrink back in anxiety and worry and fear and become ineffective for the kingdom of God. That's what persecution does to some believers. They shrink back and they hide away and they do everything they can to protect themselves. Now, the other scenario is this. When some believers undergo persecution, they are disheartened and deeply saddened that they are being persecuted. They, too, may initially become anxious, frightened, worried, and extremely fearful. But instead of following their feelings, they remember who they are and whose they are, meaning they belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. They start not trying to overly protect themselves by denying or hiding They decide to stand firm on the facts of Scripture. They realize that they cannot turn away from being brave and courageous and loving and kindly sharing the truth, sharing Jesus, and sharing the gospel while they are experiencing extreme persecution. They decide to stand up for Jesus and their Christian faith no matter what the cost may be to their personal lives and their family. This second scenario is the one that is pleasing to God. Now, this verse may sound crazy that I'm about to read. This verse may sound crazy to you, but remember, this is the Holy Spirit speaking through the Apostle Paul, so that means that it is absolutely true. We have to hear it. We have to ponder it. We have to receive it, and we have to stand in it if we hope to be counted as faithful to our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 14, verse 8. For if we live, we live for the Lord. Or if we die, we die for the Lord. Whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Now this is coming from the words and pens and heart of the Apostle Paul who was formerly Saul of Tarsus, the one that heartily stood by and was heartily in agreement that Stephen be stoned to death. He stood there with all those men's cloaks laying at his feet and he just watched Stephen being stoned. Can you, have you, none of us in this room, or probably by watching this video, have ever watched somebody being stoned to death. Just stood there and watched him. He was in hearty agreement like, yes, yes. Oh, that was a good one. Boy, that one hit him in the head. Oh, that one's really going to get him. He was in hearty agreement that this man be stoned to death and there was no crime. He had just believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. This man received the planting of the seed of the gospel through Stephen's death. You know, Stephen had no idea. There was no way Stephen, as he was dying, could know the plan and future purpose of God for Saul. That one of these men standing there would actually be saved and baptized and actually become the 14th and last apostle and actually write most of the New Testament. Stephen had no way of knowing. Aren't you and I thankful that Stephen didn't run from the persecution? Aren't we glad he's not one of those scenarios of the believers that encountered persecution and shrunk back and wouldn't say anything and wanted to hide and deny and protect themselves? 
that could have seriously affected Saul of Tarsus. So whenever person's com- persecution is coming upon you, don't first think about yourself and even your family. Because if you live, you live unto the Lord. If you die, you die unto the Lord. You and your family. Your major purpose on this planet, listen to me, is to live for Jesus Christ. You're not going to hear that kind of preaching a lot today. Because it's all about our feelings. It's all about helping us. It's all about self-help. It's all about my rights. It's about righteousness. It's not about your rights. So thank the Lord that Stephen did what he did. Think about this. It went from Saul, and we're going to find out about Saul's salvation in the very next chapter in Acts 9. But then everything kept going from there out to the Samaritans, and then out down to Azotus, and then down to Caesarea. All of this happened because Stephen was standing strong when he was persecuted. He quoted a lot of the Scripture. If you remember that chapter, he quoted a lot of the Scripture. He looked them in the eyes. He said it with love. He said it with conviction. He said it with boldness. And the Holy Spirit honored what he said, but God didn't free him from the consequences of standing strong. He died. So let's read Romans 14, 8 one more time. For if we live, we live for the Lord. Or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Now, Paul will eventually go on into Philippians and write this in chapter 1, verse 21. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul would say, if I live for Christ, that's a win. If I die for Christ, that's a win. It is a win-win. Do you see that in your life? Would you live for Christ and call it a win? And would you call dying for Christ at any cost a win? Is this how you will decide to live and die? You aren't supposed to wait until you're in the middle of a burning building to make a plan about how to escape. You're to make your plan before the house catches on fire. It's going to be much harder for you and I to stand there and take the persecution if we haven't made a plan. We need to run through some scenarios in our minds about what it might be in the future, in the coming days, what it would be like if people confronted you about your faith. And I mean seriously confronted you. Whether it was religious leaders that were living something totally opposite of you, maybe it's Islamic belief, Buddhist belief, Hindu belief, and somebody confronted you, and they were so angry about what you believed that they were willing to persecute you, torture you, or maybe even kill you. You need to know how you're going to react. And did you know it would be a great time to memorize some scripture, and to have that to where you can quote it. Did you know their persecution, they're probably going to let you go run get your Bible or get your version Bible app out and quote to them some scripture. You better have it ready and roll off your tongue what you want to say about the Bible, what you want to say about God, what you want to say about Jesus, what you want to say about the gospel. You need to know that and have it ready because you may not have the time to go get that and say, hold on just a minute, before you throw the several stones, would you let me go get my Bible? Or let me get get my iPhone and look at my YouVersion app. So what will you do when you are all of a sudden persecuted for your Christian faith? Will you have thought about it and made a conscious plan? Or will you panic, get anxious, begin to live in worry and fear, and try to hide and protect yourself and not keep proclaiming the gospel? Or... Will you decide now to stand in confidence, in faith, in the Lord Jesus Christ and speak out for Him and God's Word and the Gospel? It's a decision. Because you're going to have to have these decisions ready made. I don't think I have to tell you that our world is in trouble. Not just our city, not just the state of Texas, not just the United States, but the world. The world is in trouble. The world is confused. The world is angry. The world is in darkness. The world is believing lies. The world is living by its feelings. The world is living by earthly fallen wisdom. I know we could see that before 2020, but it is really evident now. Just watch the news. Just look at Facebook. Just talk to your friends and coworkers and neighbors and family members. Did you know I have seen more division amongst family members than I ever have? Our world is in a real real hard place and it's dark but we are the light Christ said he is the light he is the salt and then when he said I'm leaving you're going to be the light and you're going to be the salt 
So we're to be the light in a very dark, dark generation. Let's read this phrase again. Persecution is the pressure that is needed to propel the proclamation of the gospel. We desperately need something today that will propel the gospel further. We don't just need to talk about the gospel amongst believers in the church house. We can read John 3, 16 and Romans 10, 9 and 10 and verses 13 and 17. We can walk the Roman road. We can have our pamphlets. We can amen it in here. We can sing songs about it. But if the gospel stays in the church house building and in your hearts and doesn't leave these doors, what good is it? We are stopping the progression of the kingdom of God. Do I want to personally be persecuted, me and my family? Absolutely not. Do I want you to be terribly persecuted, you and your family? Absolutely not. But I'm afraid of it? No. No. Do we need it? Yes. Because it scatters the believers. Persecution scatters the believers. Why? People always move away from pressure. People always move away from pressure. Right? If you go up to hit somebody in the face, they're going to duck. They, they move away from pressure. If somebody tries to attack you, you run away. People always flee from pressure, and persecution is intense pressure. So with the unrest that's in our country and our world, and with the darkness and with the anger, we need to be prepared. Because Christianity is going to come under more attack. It's prophesied. It's been told in First and Second Timothy. It's been told in Revelation. It's been told in other books. It's coming. The great tribulation is coming. If you've read the end of the book, you know what happens. It's going to get worse before it gets better. That's not a doomsday message. I'm just telling you that's what God has said in his word. The best thing I can do as a herald of the gospel and a herald of God's word and just an ambassador to him, I'm just a piece of conduit through which he can encourage you, speak to you, convict you, and inspire you to be ready. Are you ready? You better get ready. I'm here to tell you that even football players, just the physical game of football, from what I've been told of professional players, college and professional, is that if you have not been in pads and hitting two or three times a week, you don't want to just get in your pads and go play a game on Sunday. It will kill you. You have to be ready. You have to be seasoned. You have to be prepared. Your body has to be hit and hit and hit and conditioned to being hit. It's a contact sport. And so to be ready for game day, you got to be ready to get hit. And it needs to not affect you as bad the minute you get hit because you've been getting hit three or four days ahead of that. You're ready. You're okay. You get up. You ever wonder how those guys get up? Have you ever seen some of those huge hits? And they hop right up, and they're back in the, they're trotting back. The, I'm like, call the stretcher. Stretcher, please. Stretcher, I'm out. Oh, that's really bad. Can't move. They hop right up. It's because they've been getting hit all week long. They do scrimmages against each other on their own team, college and pros. But you have to learn to be prepared. You have to be conditioned for persecution. Persecution is the pressure that is needed to propel the proclamation of the gospel. Isn't that what happened to Jesus? Oh, look at all the... Well, go back before Jesus. Go back to all the prophets. Even Stephen here said, which one of the prophets did you unbelievers not persecute? Every prophet of God got persecuted, some way, form, or fashion. And then Jesus, the very Son of God, but he was also called a prophet, a priest, and a king. Jesus was persecuted. Just watch the passion of the Christ. And then we see these believers being persecuted. This man had just become a deacon. I don't think they told him that when he was being ordained as a deacon that just in a couple of weeks you're about to die. He might go, well, then I'm not getting ordained. So basically, we need to realize that the persecution scattered the church. It scattered the believers out of their little nest, out of these homes. And it took the gospel outside their homes, outside the church out into society. Guys, that's where we've got to get the gospel. But as you notice, if there's no persecution, if there's no pressure for you to do that, you can just sit at home and just watch sitcoms. You can just sit at home and watch TV shows. You can watch movies. Uh, we can't we all sit around and watch two or three hours of a movie and maybe even follow it up with another movie. Or you can watch hours of just sports. 
Or you can take long naps. Or you can just work, 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 because you've got to make that money. Some to pay your bills and because you want to retire early. Right? We have to be pressured. We have to have something that sends us out and says, we need to take the gospel outside these doors. And that the only way that God can get us to do that because of our laziness and us being lethargic and us being comfortable, would it be okay that God remove our comfortableness and bring some persecution upon our Christian faith if it took the gospel outside of your heart and outside of the church doors and we started seeing people saved and baptized? Would that be worth a little persecution? Not everybody is jumping to do this because you're like, I still don't want the persecution. Right? We're going to partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, and we're going to do it a little bit differently than we've ever done it in the past because of social distancing. And I heard something neat to, this week, and I think this was great. I cannot remember who said it, or I'd love to give them credit. We don't need social distancing. We need physical distancing. We need as much social gathering as we can and much social fellowship as we can. Whoever started the social distancing didn't use the right word, and we've been using that now for four months. We need social gathering and yet have physical distancing. So what we're going to do is we're not going to have our deacons come up like they normally do and be able to serve you the elements. We're going to actually just have the elements here prepared and sitting on the table for you. And I want you to one at a time just come up and just first of all, all you got to do is take the cracker. You don't have to take the white sheet it's on. Just take a cracker. And then with your other free hand, take the juice and go back to your seat. But don't crowd up here. Let's don't form a line. Just Every person, when you see somebody go back, then you come and get it. When everybody has come in and gotten their particular, and don't get it for your spouse. Let your spouse come and get it, right? Let's still be healthy and safe, so just come and get it. You don't have to touch anything else here. Touch the cracker. Don't touch the container. Only touch the juice cup, and then we'll read the passage of the Lord's Supper. So get up, and let's come on now. Make your way here. Give people space to get up here, get theirs, and go back to their seat. And you can take the cloth it's sitting on or just take the cracker, whichever you prefer. As you come up here to get this, I want you to think about the great sacrifice that Jesus went through for you. Think about his love. Think about his mercy. Think about his grace. What would life be like if we didn't have Jesus Christ? I don't even want to think about it, do you? Yes, continue to come. You're doing great, just taking turns, allowing people some space. Our church is trying to, as much as possible, wear masks, wear gloves. go there you go all right yes just continue coming continue coming very good come on up even our door greeters people in media come on up you know I'm so glad that we can do this this way because the last time we offered the Lord's Supper, we had to do it by Zoom. And we had a good turnout by Zoom, but it still wasn't like the corporate body being together. Yes, we were together by Zoom, but it's so much more wonderful to do this in person. Yes, continue to come on. We're good. You guys have been very respectful of your brothers and sisters in Christ by creating some physical distancing there. There you go. Right. Anyone else? All right. (laughs) 
I'll be reading in Luke 22, starting in verse 1, going down through verse 20. Now the feast of unleavened bread, which is called the Passover, was approaching. The chief priests and the scribes were seeking how they might put Jesus to death, for they were afraid of the people. And Satan entered into Judas, who was called Iscariot, belonging to the number of the twelve. And he went away and discussed with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. They were glad and agreed to give him money. So he consented and began seeking a good opportunity to betray Jesus to them apart from the crowd. Then came the first day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. And Jesus sent Peter and John saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us so that we may eat it. They said to him, Where do you want us to prepare it? And he said to them, When you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house that he enters. And you shall say to the owner of the house, The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large furnished upper room. Prepare it there. And they left and found everything just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. When the hour had come, Jesus reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. At this point, we've never done this in our church. Let's stand in honor of Christ's sacrifice, and then we'll take the elements. Verse 18, For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. What Jesus did for us is beyond compare. And what he did will last for all eternity. Billions and billions and trillions and trillions of years never to end what he did that dying on the cross. I hope that you will celebrate him today and not just here in church, but when you go about your daily life that you will remember what happened at Easter and you'll remember what happened in that first century church and you'll say, Lord, in the first 21st century, I want to live a powerful life like they did. Should you bring persecution, Lord, I and my family will be ready. Let's sing this invitation song.